This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at FilmmakerU.com or, of course, follow us on Instagram at Filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we interview a professional uh, to discuss their work, and this week, I'm joined by composer Mark Evitz, who's recently worked on Apple TV Plus's Frog and Toad. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks for having me. I guess my first question for you is, did you look at the original stop motion for inspiration for the sound? Um, for, for Frog and Toad? Yeah, because there was like a 1980s. Yeah, so I um, I knew of it. And um, I had seen it. I did not look very deep into that. Um, the, 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 I had actually talked to the showrunner guy named Rob Hoagie about, mm -hmm. um, about, about like references and like what he was wanting to the direction he was wanting to go. Thankfully, we were sort of on the same, pretty much on the same path for that. I I didn't look at the original, but um, what was amazing was was we we were um, right after I got hired for for Frog and Toad. Um, I had a family trip down to New Orleans, and um, I actually told the the whole staff and everybody. I said, "Hey, I'm going to be gone uh, for a few days, but." Yeah, I'll be by my computer if you need me. I'll be in New Orleans. Showrunner hits me up and says, um, guess where I am right now? And I, I said, are you in New Orleans too? He was. We actually kind of, I, we ended up hooking up. He was a block away from me. He was staying like a block away from me. Really coincidental, really amazing. Uh, we actually sat right there in the, um, like like on his balcony in New Orleans and had this moment together where we were kind of talking about street sounds, street musicians, jazz, folk. And we started like kind of building the sound together um, right there in New Orleans and, and, and kind of had this like really cool back and forth discussion. Um, so, so while I'm sure Rob was thoughtful to the past and to the legacy of everything that's come from frog and toad we were also trying to craft something new mm -hmm. no it's really it's interesting because it's so different from the original mm -hmm. uh, but feels very uh of the piece in a sense like it feels oh, cool natural. great um, i think what attracted me to color correction was the fact that we were like the next stage of cinematography. And the creative side was huge, trying to understand what was wrong with an image, how to balance it, trying to understand how to let the tools do what you want them to do. Where else can the technology go? What else can we do? I'm very interested in trying to mold the image and create the best look possible. And whatever tools are out there, you want to try and latch onto them. I'm Eric Whip, and this is my course on color correction. How would you describe, I guess, discovering the sound for it? Because you sort of did a bit there. But then, like, for those who haven't seen the series, how do you describe the music sound? Because it is sort of uh, all these different, you know, different yes. music coming together. So I'm from a town in Kentucky, western Kentucky, called Paducah. Paducah is the halfway point in between Chicago and New Orleans, right, right along the Mississippi River. So it's a riverboat town. But the interesting thing about Paducah is you're, you've got these like musical influences from down from Chicago, this jazz from Chicago, but you have this Dixieland thing. But it's the state of Kentucky, so you have like this Appalachian music, bluegrass. It's also two hours away from Nashville, so it's country. It's a cauldron of different sounds and different textures that my home is hometown is. I started describing this to Rob, and I said, "What? What if it like because?" Frog and Toad are they're outside a lot and it's got this like organic approach. I really told him, I go, I never want to get big 
an orchestral with this at all. I, I, I feel like the sound needs to be intimate. And if you if you look at as far as like uh, ensemble size, if you look at the show, um, it feels like it's been zoomed in to a, to what could be in your backyard. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's this is this really tight zoom in all, all the the vegetables and the mushrooms are huge. You know, it's this like really, really like tight community, this really thing. So I wanted that sound to sound like that. I never wanted it to be big. I wanted it to be woody. I wanted it to be folky, jazzy, have this thing, but never get even in the like more orchestral parts, it never gets above a string quartet. It yeah. never gets above a wind woodwind quartet. It stays there, but it's got banjos, it's got mandolin, fiddle, all, and piano, all these things that are just like singular instruments kind of driving it. Well, what's interesting is you say that, and then I was reading one of the articles that you were interviewed in, and you referred to a hot club guitar. Yes. I've never heard of in my life. I looked it up, but I'm wondering if you could describe it and describe its sound for people. Sure. So um, Hot Club was a sound um, from like 1910s, 1920s jazz. It was like French jazz. There's a guy named Django Reinhardt who, um, who, who kind of developed this sound. So one of the big things for me with this show was – Again, like the story itself is very simplistic. It's meant for uh, uh, little kids, and it's it's kind of has this like really simplicity in the words. I read an article um, from Arnold Lobel years ago in like the seventies that that he was talking about when he was writing um, the the words. He tried to not use large words he tried to to think when he would write things out he would simplify 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 and just edit 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 and if he didn't have to use a large word he wouldn't on purpose it was all very thoughtful and he um he said there was the word avalanche in one of the stories and he goes what's a simpler word for avalanche and he said, thought there isn't one Th this is this is the 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 word that needs to be taught to to younger younger uh readers and i was just so moved at like the sophistication of of really every single word being important every single aspect being important so for me i took this same approach where i thought what is what are simple melodies what are simple chord progressions that might sound familiar but I can make this sophisticated. And for me, it was two things. It was um, old, uh, uh, like standards, jazz standards, and folk melodies. So what I tried to do was I tried to think in terms of how would a 1920s player, that's how would they approach a simple jazz melody that we still might sing today? How mm -hmm. would a folk tune approach this this simple melody that we that i wanted it to feel timeless and i felt like that that sound from 1920s jazz and you know around that 20s 30s um folk melodies might help me get that way so i really would try to write exactly well i'm not trying to compare myself to lobel by any stretch but I would try to think in in those terms. How can I make a simple simple melody or a simple mm -hmm. chord progression make it sophisticated into where every little piece matters, but also not hit too much with it? So, Hot Club. I'm bringing it right back around for it. Hot Club guitar is the sound of that. Those Django Reinhardt uh, guitar. It's sort of like a rhythmic uh, pattern that 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 he does to keep things driving but it's also very um while, while sophisticated it's very simple and tries to it, it it really drives things along so i i tried to implement that into the score 
So how did, um, when you're creating the score, how did you break down, you know, the sounds for each character? It's like, did each character have their own sort of sound? And did you use yeah. specific instruments for them? And... Yeah, I did. Um, there was like, for example, Snail. Um, Snail is a, this this male carrier and delivers mail and if you look at snail snail is is very slow it's a snail but um aparna who did the the vocal for for snail and and the writing was so well done in snail's mind snail is moving at the speed of light like <laughs> moving really fast and so it's this kind of comedic thing so i tried to like take for, for the character of Snail, I took a uh, a banjo, and that was always – it was always, like, percussive or banjo, something that moves fast. And I tried to make that the Snail approach because in Snail's perspective, everything's moving quickly. It, it, from the viewer's perspective, it's not. But that sort of that dichotomy makes kind of – it makes it fun, makes it kind of a little bit funny. So I had that. There's another character, Gopher, who – um has uh it's, it's always underground and popping up and for gopher i i always did a bass clarinet because it, it kind of has this uh boom like it's always this little like mm. bassy thing like popping up out of nowhere so i did use that that approach we we actually rob and i had chatted and we we wanted that we wanted everyone to have that kind of like their motifs and their their um their you know unique identifying traits to each character so we took like a peter and the wolf approach mm -hmm. where where each character had their their own kind of sound and not, and i tried to make it to where it wasn't um too jarring you know i i tried to keep it in the scene try to keep it all all there but at the same time to where you know that uh, you're immersed in the character. Hmm. Now, I have a question for you that I ask all the composers I talk to. So people watching are probably going to be like, oh, God, here comes the question. But you toured a lot as mm -hmm. a musician. And you got to play in places like Carnegie Hall, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so what I found is like the sound of the rooms you're recording in play a huge part in creating the sound. So when you get onto a project like this, do you try to find rooms or spaces that will create a nice, a specific sound, or do you uh, do it all sort of digitally inside the the system? That is a fantastic question. Um, <laughs> yes, actually, that that that's a really good question. So um, the answer is yes. I had um, I I recorded a lot in here. If you look, I have uh, drapes behind me. I have like like pretty. It's a pretty dead room. Um, so for a lot of the acoustic driven stuff that I'm recording, I want a more dead room that I can I can play around with mm -hmm. with um, the the the. I, I've got a little bit more control. However, um, for banjo, there. Uh, there was a couple of scenes where I uh, got a friend of mine, Tim Galloway, to to play on the track. And Tim has kind of this big open room. And I wanted – there was a couple couple of times where I wanted him to, to track and get that a little bit more of his room to give – if it was an outside spot, to give a little bit more um, space to it. Um, some stuff was my whole approach in recording is, is it's, um, it, it's like a hybrid. It's not completely in the box. It's not completely, uh, recorded just on singular instruments like, like I have here. So I did like sort of a hybrid approach. I've got a guy in, um, Brooklyn, Alex Spiegelman that played a lot of the clarinet parts for me. Alec is great. And um a fantastic clarinet player and he has this <laughs> he has this um setup 
where God, this is such a good question. I, I've never been asked this question. I'm so excited about it. He has this setup where he gives me, I think it's something like, I must see if I can get this right. I think it's four different microphones and he has them in different spots in his, in his studio. And um, depending on the scene, I would choose where I thought sounded the best for right, for so. the microphone. Sometimes I'd I'd try to blend it all in and try to make it a thing, but there were times where it needed to be a little bit. It, they're outside. I wanted it to feel a little bit more out, so I would choose that. Great question. <laughs> yeah. Now, because you did all those tourings, did you ever? I'm in Toronto, Canada. Mm -hmm. Did you ever come to Toronto and play at Massey Hall? I have not. I know of it, but I've never yeah. played there. Oh, okay, I love Toronto. I, yeah, because I would I would love to hear your thoughts on the sound of Massey Hall, uh, if ever you play there. <laughs> so I I played yeah I toured for about twenty years and I played a lot all over the world. I I know of Massey Hall. I've never played there. I've always wanted to, but um yeah it's it's from what I hear it's a great room you know yeah well they did a massive overhaul uh, like they did um. They did sort of a small expansion because originally when it was built in the 1800s, they didn't have bathrooms in it. You had to mm. go outside and use the outhouse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they added bathrooms, but they had to do a special, like they had sound people come in just to, you know, oversee it. And it's oh, that's awesome. Nice now. Yeah. 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 Sounds awesome. Um, now, I'd like to know, because you've done all this touring, is there, because one of the things that I always loved uh, when I would go to bands, specifically smaller shows where it's not just one big band playing, but like you have openers, is you discover these local bands that like mm -hmm. no one's ever heard of outside of the like the local community. Is there a band that you discovered that you're like, people need to hear about this band? Oh, um, that's another great question. The answer is most definitely... I remember um, once, oh, man, where was I? I was in, I think I was in Montana or somewhere out West. Man, I wish I could remember this guy's name too. And he was an opener. He was a local opener for us. And me and the guitarist of this, uh, we were touring with an artist named Rodney Atkins. He was a country artist. And me and the guitarist heard this guy singing and we actually got his number. He never called us though. He he um we we got his number and we tried to get him to come to Nashville because we wanted to we he was phenomenal. He was a yeah. guitar player. Man, oh, I wish I could remember his name because he was so good. And I would recommend people to check him out. But yes, to answer your question, I I've I've seen both sides of that. There's been people that's very, very, very good. And then there's been, I watched one time, funny story, I, I saw a band and they were playing and they were opening up for us. I was in Indianapolis. They were opening up for us and they, um, the the drummer threw a stick at the singer and I thought, oh, this is, must be part of their thing. And then they start arguing, <laughs> drummer picks up a cymbal, throws it at the singer. And then the bass player goes, I quit. And then they the band broke up on stage <laughs> on stage mid set, and I was like, "This is one of the best shows I've ever seen. I can't keep my eyes off of it." But at the same time, like it was a, a I, I was like, "If this is their show, this is this is great. <laughs> it's so entertaining." But I, I I've definitely seen both sides of the spectrum. I wish I could think of that guy's name now that I'm I'm on it because it, he was so good. But to answer your question, you know, it, it it's a and and to expound on that, it, it's an interesting thing to to hear local artists. And any time that I do that's that's really good, I talk to him a lot of times. I'll say, you know, great set or whatever, but. I always encourage them to to kind of to get out of their their local town, not not to like leave it and forget it and leave it behind. Not that at all. As you can hear from Frog and Toad, I'm yeah. I'm all about my hometown. I think my hometown of Paducah is great, and I I brought it with me 
to a, a studio. You know, I brought it with me to to that, and and that's an you know an encouraging thing to 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 younger or or people that are in their local spot to to take what they know from the local scene and and take it and bring it have your voice and bring it to a larger stage because a lot of times you know people people don't get out of their hometown and they don't they don't um the, the world needs to hear unique voices mm -hmm. and if you've got a unique voice and you're in your your local hometown it's that's great and and for some people that's fine but i i think that that you know the world needs to come together now more than ever and and these things of bringing bringing what's you to the to the bigger community could be something that could really draw people together yeah well and i remember cuz i was in a really bad band i'll just say <laughs> it wasn't a good <laughs> band but we did that we would tour and i remember i i still have like a bunch of cd's that are just cuz it was the 90s so people would make their stuff in their bedroom yeah. to a cd and i have like a bunch of cds that were burned in someone's bedroom that i'm like this guy's amazing and yeah since absolutely there's a girl brie what is her name now, now that i'm saying it, there's another lady oh man i wish i could remember brie brie uh, i don't remember her last name and she was an opener i was working with a um an artist named Lindsay lawler and Brie was our opener and Brie gave us her CD, same thing. And we listened to it. And I remember we listened to it and thought she was so good. And she ended up moving to Nashville. I'm not sure what she's doing now, but she was fantastic. And, um, but we encouraged her. We said, we said, this is great. You should do that. And, and that's to say, like, if get your music out there, anybody that's like, has a little bit of hesitancy, just get it out there. Get it out there and then move on to the next thing. If you're like, ah, but they may not like it. Okay, they may not, but they may love it. So get it out there. Keep working on the next thing and just keep moving and keep pushing your stuff out there. Yeah, because that's how you – it's it's so interesting because like, you know, like I said, we were in a bad band. But like you per, you can see your progression as you're getting because you're putting out bad yeah. music. And it's like, oh, that was bad. I'm going to improve. I'm going to change this. And it's – and you don't know until you start getting feedback or seeing the audience being like, what the hell is this? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that is a thing. It's like, you, you know, if you, if it, the more you put out there, the more you can learn from those things, the more you can learn uh, uh, who you are, if, if mm -hmm. you're putting it out there. And I mean, I've definitely been on, um, you know, 30 years ago when I was recording it, it's not my favorite stuff for yeah. sure, you know, but I put it out there and, you know, you learn from it, you move on and, and yeah, you're, you're only going to improve yourself. Now I ask a favor. If you do remember those two people's names, please email us. And we'll put them in the, the YouTube. I will definitely do that. I'll, I'll reach out to the guitarist and ask him what his name was. I, I can't remember, but yeah, I'll definitely do that. Now, you also have done stuff for like Nas and the game, and that is completely opposite to what you what we're seeing in mm -hmm. Frog and Toad. And so I'm wondering, like, how do you approach music writing when it's specific for someone else, as opposed to something like this, where you're like working with the composer or sorry, the um, creator? Yeah. So it, it be, it's all storytelling. It's yeah. all just getting um figuring out what someone wants and adding your voice or or hearing what other people do it's it's like a back and forth it doesn't matter like yeah i've i've worked on hip hop albums i've worked on country albums i've worked on bluegrass i've worked on kids shows it, it it's all over the map but at the end of the day it's all about storytelling so i know this sounds like weird but i really truly don't think in terms of genre i think in terms of what can be added to the story and what can be told in a in a certain way now there are for nas and 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 the game i'm not putting banjo on there obviously <laughs> but i uh, uh like i was on a song i we we 
co-wrote a song called Brunch on Sundays. And mm-hmm. so I'm listening to this track and I'm thinking, oh, this is like kind of this like it the whole his whole story on that is is that like they're they're enjoying success because of the struggles they've gone through mm-hmm. and 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 that's you know a, a, a pretty common thread through hip hop is is like struggles and that kind of thing so i thought well what can i add strings wise that would sound like that well i tried on that i i laid down like i think a string section maybe like violins and violas and it was this kind of like throwback to the 70s soul and so i i tried to implement those aspects into like the broader story of here's here's where we've come from here's where we are so while i had this 70 soul i also had this like glamour to mm-hmm. it as well here's the struggle but here's where we are now it's the it's the glamour um and so obviously this is i'm i'm not trying to appropriate or anything this isn't my story this is this is this was Nas's story but i at the same time tried to think how can i um how can i add to 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 his story how can i not take away from anything and just add to to his amazing music and so that's sort of the approach i do for for hip hop but if i'm producing a country artist from uh say montana i i don't ever think how can i add to this i think okay well what experience or sorry how can i take away from this and do my thing on it i always think what experience do they have what experience do i have okay can we start a communication and figure out um how to collaborate on this what's a way to enhance your story that maybe i can tell a, a small part of of my story in that in 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 the way this is how I would see this is how I would do this but it's all about collaboration and, and listening and hearing what the others um, are saying to enhance that story so it's so it's the same if it's country bluegrass hip hop it's to me it's all the same it's all a collaborating and storytelling I I wish I could show you something but there was a, a place here called soul pepper theater here mm-hmm. in toronto and they had a guy from detroit and i guess they were the only ones who would produce it but it was a uh, you would go there and he did the history of de- music through the story of detroit so it was mm-hmm. like music before ford company came and then when ford's company came they paid the most amount of money so all of a sudden all these people moved to detroit but they also brought their music. So it'd be like Dixieland. It'd be, you know, yeah, whatever country, anything. And so it shows how the change in the sound and then it slowly goes through the history into Motown and then into Jack White and oh, all these things. Amazing. And it's and as they go, they like stop and tell like, this is why this is important. This is why it's like an amazing experience just to see the history of one city through sound. That sounds incredible. Yeah. Yeah. But and it was it was frustrating because I was like, I'm gonna buy the CD. And then I went out and they're like, we don't have a CD. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> yeah, I bet. So yeah. well that I, that sorry. I was just say that that is like it it is interesting how local music and how the evolution of local music to me like everything there's a lot there's this whole like kind of nationalization through you know instagram or or whatever it is globalization to 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 where everything sounds like it's all starting to kind of sound similar and we're 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 seeing where music is like really similar where if we go back to um like if we go back to the the even the the 60s music and 70s music definitely had a, a vibe like if you listen to the beach boys you no question that's california music yeah. zero question about it that's what that is if you listen to um uh like elvis memphis you you know right away what that is and yeah. so 
I think <laughs> to me, I think that's so cool. And if yeah. there's like a Toronto band, I want to hear what Toronto sounds like. I want to see what that sounds like. And just just like on Frog and Toad, I tried to bring this my hometown to to that. Like I tried to take that and and what's this look like? What's what's that? Because ultimately that's what we're doing we're all we're all you know telling our own journeys telling our own things and we all have different ears different influences and different um different paths to get us to where we are and i think it's really cool when i hear a band um like even like bleachers which is a a, a big band uh based out of i think they're based out of new jersey but Jack Antonoff, who's the the lead guy that he produced, like Taylor Swift, and he's a huge producer. But lately, he's gone so deep. His like latest album, it sounds like like you can tell his influence was like Bruce Springsteen, and it's like coming out. He's got this like New Jersey thing coming to me. Like I hear that, and I go, well, this is like really interesting because we're we're seeing who that person is on the inside. We're yeah. seeing their their childhood and their and and their entire you know growing up so on display. So personally, I love the local thing. Well, and I love just discovering people. That yeah. That's why I asked that question. Like, do you know of any people that we should hear? Because it's so many. I've got a, a blank CD from some guy I met on a boardwalk in California. And it, I listen to it regularly. <laughs> like, That's fantastic. And I'm like, it's so good. And I'm like, and meanwhile, like no one, no one else heard, has heard of it whenever I'm like, hey, have you heard this and share it? So. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Th- th- there are, um, there was a guy named Dylan Hodges. He goes by Fire Kid now. And Dylan Hodges was um one that he was like a young kid. He ended up getting signed to Atlantic. I don't I'm not sure he's still with Atlantic, but um he, he was like a young kid from Alabama, from Muscle Shoals, Alabama. It was this kind of bluegrass guitar player, but ended up doing like a bunch of um pop stuff and 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 but he's great. But it's like it's one of those things that you get these CDs. And you see people at a young age and you never know like what they're going to become, yeah. what they're going to do. It's it's really cool and inspirational too. Yeah, totally. Um, now I have one last question for you. What would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film or TV show to watch? Mm. I don't know if it's guilty pleasure, but Star Trek The Next Generation is definitely up there for me. I I've seen every episode approximately i mean it has to be a hundred times and i absolutely love it it's such a um the music on it is is fantastic and sounds great but i that is my show that i can just put on and watch a million times well thank you so much for letting me interview today absolutely thanks for having me And that's it for this week, everyone. Make sure to check us out at FilmmakerU.com. And of course, follow us on Instagram at Filmmaker underscore U. I'm Gordon Raquel. Thanks for watching. This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs.